Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Keith Kroc, former Under Secretary of State and 2022 Nobel Peace Prize nominee, to talk about Taiwan. Is the island going to war with China? And if it does, how would the conflict impact life here in America? Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Tiffany, thanks so much. I appreciate it. So right now, semiconductors are in the news a lot, but also the Russia-Ukraine war. And so with the Russia-Ukraine war, some people are now saying Taiwan is next. And so if that were to happen, if China were to go after Taiwan, how would that affect like everyday Americans' lives? Well, there'd be a number of ways. Um, if, uh, you know, uh, Xi pulled a Putin and went after Taiwan, you know, the first and most obvious one is in the high tech area because TSMC is the world's leader in the manufacturing of semiconductors. And semiconductors, uh, it's the most important sector in the high tech sector. And they make the most advanced chips uh, of any country. Uh, and that's why the onshoring, the $12 billion or onshoring that we did when I was under Secretary of State. Uh, was was so critical to secure that supply chain. It was the largest onshore in U.S. history and had a tremendous ripple effect. What is the importance of semiconductors? How would Americans feel the effects of if suddenly Taiwan were cut off? Well, you know, we're, we're experiencing a, a semiconductor shortage right now. And so that gives us a good glip, a glimpse into the future. It, you know, auto companies are slowing down their production of cars. So it, ha it has a ripple effect. And then obviously semiconductors go in to everything from cell phones to uh, advanced, to any kind of communications, computers, cars, it's toys, it's literally uh, everywhere. Obviously it also goes into uh, military uh, equipment. So it is literally the base of everything. It's the most important industry in the world. And this is why uh, Secretary General Xi is absolutely obsessed about owning the semiconductor uh, business. He's put in uh, roughly over $300 billion to try to really build up his business. And, and now recently, he's appointed a, a chip czar with a budget over the next 10 years of a trillion dollars. And this is why, for example, uh, last week, I was with uh, Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimundo, as well as uh, some other national security experts, and talking about the need to pass the United States Innovation Competitive Act, which was a bill we designed uh, to help the onshoring of semiconductors in the United States. And so while you were under Secretary of State, you had a term, trust principle doctrine, kind of working on peace diplomacy in the technology world. So how did you see that playing out while you were in that role, especially in regards to Taiwan? Yeah, you, you know, it, if you look at it this way, uh, Tiffany, you look at the things that uh, the free world values, things like integrity, accountability, transparency, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for property, Respect, respect for sovereignty of nations, respect for the environment, respect for human rights. These are things that we honor uh, in the free world, but authoritarian regimes like China and Russia do not. As a matter of fact, they use those against us to their strategic advantage. So let me just put it this way. Let's, let's say, Tiffany, uh, I'm competing against you and I can steal your intellectual property. I don't have to be transparent. I can lock you out of my market. I can uh, use coal-fired power plants for my energy. I can use slave labor. I'm the law, or I don't have to obey the law. I'm going to beat you every time. And that's what we effectively, uh, that abuse and coercion and co-option and subsidize, all that. That's what we call the power principle. The trust principle actually uses those principles for our strategic advantage. And so these things that, that we honor, and that's what we use, for example, to build the Clean Network Alliance of Democracies 
to defeat the Chinese Communist Party's master plan for 5G. So in, in one jujitsu move, we just flipped them on their back and we actually used it against them. So we actually weaponize the very principles that protect our freedom. And that comes so much into play with Taiwan. Taiwan was one of the first countries on that clean network. And if you look at Taiwan, they are a role model democracy and they honor these ideals, these values, these, these trust principles. And, uh, you know, the key is, and I was asked this in my Senate confirmation committee here uh, by Senator Coons when he asked me what my strategy would be to combat China's aggression. And I said, well, what I would do is I would harness the three areas of U.S.'s biggest competitive advantage by rallying uh, our, our allies and our partners. The second is to leverage the innovation and resources of the private sector. And the third one is to amplify the moral high ground of these trust principles. So in essence, that doctrine uh, created really uh, the first government-led initiative that defeated uh, China Inc. And it's turned into an enduring uh, model that's endorsed by both sides out. So with the clean network that was really able to just cripple Huawei and as you mentioned, just take away China's dominance in the 5G sector. So in, le in lieu of that, what steps can be taken to have that happen with say semiconductors? Because China is really going after that sector. Right, so you're seeing that uh, play out right now. Um, so one of the things, and, and this is one of the things I was uh, talking earlier last week when I was back in Washington, is we're putting together, uh, United States is proposing uh, partnering with Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. So this is unifying and rallying those allies. It's also leveraging uh, that private sector, and it's based on these democratic uh, trust principles. That's really, really an important thing. And if you think about it, uh, uh, this trusted technology, where uh, the definition of trusted technology is that it meets those trust principles. So in other words, if, if, uh, if there's a company that comes from a country that has a National Intelligence Act that requires any company, state-owned or, or otherwise, or any Chinese citizen to turn over any data, any information, any proprietary technology upon request to the Chinese Communist Party or the PRC government or the PLA, or suffer the consequences, then that doesn't meet that criteria. So at the end of the day, Tiffany, it is all about trust. And trust is the most important word in any language. You partner with people you trust, you buy from people you trust, uh, you love people you trust. And and nobody trusts, you know, for example, these totalitarian twins, Putin and Xi. Going back to the onshoring part from earlier, so there are talks that TSMC is set to open a plant in Arizona. And now some critics online are saying if Taiwan loses the edge in semiconductor production, there would be no need to defend it. What's your take on that? By the way, there would always be a need to defend Taiwan. And the reason is they are a role model of democracy in that region. As a matter of fact, they're a role model of democracy for the entire world. They also dispel the cheese myth that the Chinese culture cannot survive a democracy and it needs an authoritarian government. So that's a needle kind of sticking in his side uh, on that. And by the way, Taiwan has also been a great friend and a great ally uh, with, the, with the United States. So they punch above their weight, uh, not just in technology and semiconductors, but they punch above their weight in terms of uh, the role model, uh, you know, of these of these great people, um, and this is why uh, Taiwan is so very important uh, to the world, 
to democracy. And now with what's going on in Ukraine, it makes their importance even more so. So going forward, since Taiwan is so crucial to America, what steps can be taken to really make sure war doesn't break out between China and Taiwan? Well, you know, I think uh, here's what I think one of the most important things is, and this is what I was pushing for and leading up to, is a trade agreement. Uh, And the reason why I say that, so about a week before uh, I was going over uh, on this historic trip to, to Taiwan, word got out. So President Tsai, she lifted the beef and pork restrictions, which is a big, big deal in the country of Taiwan. And ag is a very important, uh, uh, you know, they have really strong lobbying power. And, and that was the thing that was holding us off from a, a trade agreement. So uh, what I could see when I was over there, that it cost a lot of political capital for to, to do that. So that's really a big major reason why we, we should do it because they really went out of their way for it. But the other thing is about a, a free trade agreement is that it's more than trade. So when the United States does a trade agreement with another country, it creates a halo effect for US private sector investment. So then all of a sudden, all this US private sector investment comes in just because of the mere fact of the halo effect of that trade agreement. And then when U.S. private sector investment comes in, so does the allies' private sector investment comes in. And by the way, that's what we want because if there is, uh, if something kinetic breaks out in Taiwan, we want we want our allies and we want them invested. And it seems like a lot of your work with the U.S.-Taiwan relations has really been noticed and is in the spotlight. You are a nominee for the 2022 Peace Nobel Peace Prize. So what was that like finding out that you were nominated? Well, I, I, I can tell you this, Tiffany, it was a surprise. I didn't even know about it until it got accepted uh, by the Nobel Committee. And you can imagine uh, how humbling that is. And, and, and also, by the way, it's about the team because I had a great team behind me. But you know, it also made me think about the people of the Ukraine, of the people of Taiwan. Because when you look, for example, what's going over, what's going on in Taiwan, the heartbreaking, vi- uh, uh, or in the Ukraine, the heartbreaking violence that, that's going on. I mean, we need that trust principle, that clean network of democracies more than ever to stand up to the Ukraine. And we do in Taiwan too. And can you imagine, you know, I mean, you're seeing grandmas over the Ukraine who have sniper rifles and bombs going off everywhere. Now these people have courage. By the way, the Taiwanese uh, people have courage. I mean, yeah, okay, so 40 fighters and bombers uh, greeted me when I went to Taiwan, but Taiwan, this going on all the time. So that's what made it, that's really what made it so humbling, Tiffany. But I can tell you one thing. Uh, I spent this last week um, up at West Point Military Academy and uh, instructing these young men and women cadets on utilizing the trust principle to build an alliance of democracies and I'll tell you, these transformational leaders of tomorrow, uh, you know, walking away from that, I'm just really, really optimistic about the future. Well, Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. That was Keith Kroc, former Under Secretary of State and 2022 Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And for those joining our full episode, joining us after the break, real estate analyst Greg Isaacson will talk about the effects of Shanghai's lockdown on the real estate and business sectors. That's coming up after the break here on China in Focus.